Well, I'm back again, it's day two, I'm late, I had another appointment first. There's a session underway about what contact with extraterrestrials would teach us about the future of humanity, so I'm uh, going to rush along and join in. as an arena for life, and potentially for colonisation by humans in the future, it looks much more habitable. A positive result in terms of the discovery of extraterrestrial life, these studies, it seems to me, are, are giving us a, um, um, vastly expanding glimpses of our, of our potential future. Well, but as, as null results continue to pile up, let's, let's basically have no proof yet of any kind of life beyond the Earth, let's learn intelligence. Um, what are we learning? Well, well the, the, you know, the, the, the continuing silence, the great silence, as it goes on, as it deepens, does reflect back on us, I think. You know, if it does turn out to be the strangest of all Fermi solutions that we're alone, um, that, that's, that's, the, that's the only answer we know for sure, you know, is, is on the table right now. Then what responsibility does that give us? You know, it must mean that life, like ours, intelligence is difficult to evolve in this universe. Um, uh, we surely have the responsibility not to blow ourselves up for a start, because to me the thought of that happening, <coughs> and then the universe mindlessly unfolding this great piece of useless clockwork with nobody to observe it, is it, it, it important. What about how it would feel to achieve contact? I mean, my personal nightmare, I suppose, with contact is not so much of hostility, but of facing superiority. And I think this comes from reading Gulliver's Travels as a boy. Um, big mistake, don't let your kids read Gulliver's Travels before they're about 10. Because the mice look like the locutions is one thing, but when he faces the intelligent horses, the winnings, and they're superior. I mean, I think it's one of the scariest depictions of a, a truly intelligent, superior alien in, in all literature. Uh, my, my hope is that if we do meet the alien, and if we can break through the, the barriers of strangeness and unfamiliarity, that what, we'll, we, what, that what we will find will be a kind of consolation. We'll find that we come home in a, in a way. This is a personal theory, really, but... We, we humans evolved in a world full of other hominids who disappeared you know, quite recently in, um, in terms of our evolutionary time scale. The Neanderthals, 30,000 years ago, the, the, the hobbits in Indonesia, much more recently than that, and perhaps there were other examples around the world. So we evolved in a world full of other kinds of people. So we must have muscles in our head which enable us to go over the hill and confront not just strange humans, but strange other humans. We must be able to deal with, 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 with people like that. And I think there's something in our head that uh, kind of knows something is missing. You know, I think we are a lonely species, uh, but we don't know. We know something is missing, we don't quite know what. Which is possibly why we fill the imaginative universe with gods and aliens. We're trying to fill the gap that we don't quite understand exists. Uh, previous presentations of this uh, panel, especially uh, Stephen Dix, and what I found interesting about his was he's a historian and he's telling us about the future. Now, if I had some advice for Stephen, I would say, <coughs> you know, it's best to spend time with history and not the future because every day the future gets shorter and history gets longer. So. My talk today is called The Transcension Hypothesis, Cosmic Censorship of Advanced Civilizations. Uh, these slides, like it says in yellow at the bottom, are available at accelerating.org slash slides by the HTML. If anyone would like to uh, look at them later, there's my email. I, I tend to put too much on the slide, uh, so if you're interested in going back more to it later. Hi, right, it's uh, Professor John Elliott. Of um, Leeds Metropolitan University. My area is intelligence engineering, by the way, so I'm an AI, so I'm just going to sort of declare my bias in some ways. However, I'm going to go back to the question, um, and so there's a symmetry to it. The study of ET, what does that tell us about us, her humanity, but it's also looking at humanity and looking at seeing what it may be, that what ET is like. We're looking at biological units, and we're also talking about now artificial artifacts, uh, when they're especially intelligent. But there's also a third way, which I'll go on really prompting you for a reaction, which is 
the cyborg way, which is using AI to um, improve us and turn us into human V2. Now, yesterday I began to think that with all these exoplanets that we're discovering, it's surely now only a matter of time before we discover traces of, of life and possibly not too long before we find a signal from somewhere, so traces of intelligence. It, there's, a, there's an inevitability building up behind this and I began to feel at last, yeah, this is real, this is happening. This morning's session was, was frankly weird. There's talk of technological civilizations as a matter of course entombing themselves inside black holes and that this universe is one that's recycled many times so the laws, the natural laws have been refined so that they're like that because that's the way it has to be for life to develop and so on. Um, pretty tough going. This afternoon is going to be simpler, more simple anyway, it's addressing the matter of how we deal with protocols for interacting with other civilizations when we do eventually make contact. Good afternoon. Uh, let me give a very brief overview of some of the work that's already been done uh, on bringing SETI to the United Nations. Uh, we'll hear a lot about the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space uh, in this session. Um, and actually, the United Nations has already been briefed once uh, on SETI. This is, was a report uh, by the IAA's uh, International Academy of Astronautics. Um, so, rather than talking about the parts of the UN and bodies, I'm going to talk about issues, issues associated with extraterrestrial life and arising political issues that might come in under the uh, UN agenda. So I'm going to talk about planetary protection because that's how I first got involved in all of these and that's really a science policy issue. And then there are several challenges that have come up recently for the Outer Space Treaty for Coast Park Committee on Space Research and they have to do with ethical considerations about life and extraterrestrial environment, the increase in activities, the anticipated increase of activities in, in various sectors, and then the wild card, what to do if extraterrestrial life is discovered, and by that I'm talking probably a microbial life, uh, life form on a place like Mars. So if you look at the outer space, you wouldn't send humans. Does that mean you will or you won't send another spacecraft to bring samples back? And does, should there be some sort of limitation on human access um, on Mars? So we don't know whether an extraterrestrial um, life form discovered in the solar system would interfere with science or commerce. Um, we don't know whether sustainable development and use is possible. We have declared that outer space is the resource for humankind. What if there are really Martians? So we have a lot of questions. So the current trajectory under the Outer Space Treaty, space science will share resources with space commerce and others. We do need an integrated planetary scale policy, set of policies and management. And extraterrestrial discovery is a big unknown. Well, uh, my presentation is about how I could brief uh, COPOS just last June, and here is the picture, about protecting the central part of the far side of the moon against wild future possible exploitations by all kinds of activities, that is, uh, industrial, military, private entrepreneurs, and so on. So let me tell you. Uh, roughly the, the idea behind this story that, that went on for over 20 years, I would say. Well, the previous speakers more or less have referred already to the UN, uh, and I'm sure that Maslam will also refer to the UN after me. Um, so partly for that reason, my talk will be heavily slanted towards a form of contact of extraterrestrial life which will be threatening or which might pose a threat to us on Earth, rather than the more broad perspective. And then, of course, also, what are we going to do when we actually perceive a threat? So I'd um, like to start by categor categorically denying that I am the alien, uh, the ambassador for aliens of the United Nations. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got that off my chest. <laughs> okay, I mean, the, the brilliant presentations by everyone, um, I don't even have to say very much uh, at this stage. But, of course, the aim of my being here is to explain to you what would you do if you wanted to bring a topic like extraterrestrial life to the United Nations. Thank you uh, both. The meeting's uh, nearly over. I'm here with uh, Stephen Baxter, the author of some of my favourite recent science fiction. Stephen, uh, Fermi Paradox, eh? you've come up with several uh, 
options in your books? Which of them you, do you believe? What's the most likely? Ooh, that's a really hard question. I did. I, 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 I wrote three books and, a, and a, three novels and a bunch of short stories about the Fermi paradox. And in the novels, in the first we were alone, you know. In the second, it's a dangerous universe, so life gets wiped out before we can build a galactic culture over and over again. And in the third, it was a spooky solution, you know, backstage aliens. The universe is a lie, basically. And which do I believe? Well, I, I can't, I can't, I can't believe we're alone. Just the the, the new results from the from the, um, the planet searches. Well, only ten years since those books were published, even. You know, it's it's extraordinary. It's impossible to believe we're alone. And, and yet, where are they? Um, the more the more uh, the science goes on, the, the the more puzzling it seems. I I, um, I, I suspect what we're seeing is uh, a universe where it's difficult for life to spread far or to do anything large. So, for instance, maybe there's ne it's never going to be possible to do FTL. For example, and therefore you might you might get a lot of cultures who are basically stay at home, but on a spectacular scale, build, building ring worlds and Dyson spheres and so on, but not really interstellar. So I think I think we might be looking at basic limitations of physics, something like that, possibly. But but still no signals. Well, but who's who's going to send a signal? I mean, why would you? Uh, if we've got a very sparse number of long-lived cultures, they would signal. But, oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a mystery. It but if, 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 if you ask me what, what, what I believe, I think I can't believe we're alone. But I think there must be some. I think there's something we're missing. Put it that way. There's something we're missing. Yeah, I think I would agree with you on yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Time to go back in. I think. Let the universal matter law, uh, and we need not to uh, invent uh, some matter law. Uh, 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 from uh, those people who uh, go uh, after Kant. Kant already all say and write. For many of you, that what's happening is a gradual increase in legitimacy for SETI. Uh, many of you are here, you would not have been here before, because gradually and grindingly over the years, another level, I know. Uh, Dr. Othman, we spoke about this, a slightly ratcheted up level of discussion is okay within, say for instance, the confines of the UN or the diplomatic community. And this grinding pace of legitimization of something that we all know is a perfectly reasonable quasi-scientific topic. I say quasi because it is a topic without any subject matter. The has, has got to accelerate. <laughs> they um, they know about the um, the black holes that this guy is attracting everybody to, and they don't want to get the invitation <laughs> to leave this universe. Um, they know about some kind of danger that uh, that homes in on signals. I mean, that's an obvious one. Um, they know. Well, it's late in the day. Did you have to do this to me, Jim? <laughs> but I'm um, wrong. You can ask for a suggestion. Um, they know, well, well, here's another one. They know that if um, they make themselves known and their location know, we can then zero in on them and demand our rights, um, at which it actually could bite me in the rear and be an argument in favor of Messi. I'm perfectly willing to consider that possibility. Um, th that's three. Does anybody else think of any? God's phone number. Oh. What? <laughs> God's phone number. <laughs> yes. Prime well, the, the point is, the point is, this is the sort of thing that has been worked out in our in our genre of literature um, in great detail, and I just feel more confident about us being able to do this if, for instance, Stephen Baxter has agreed. To um, to do something, Stephen, uh, you you haven't rethought it from last night, have you? Oh. To create to, to help create an advisor, science fictional advisory board that has the the memory of all of these thought experiments and makes them available to this community. No, you suggested that. I didn't really agree to it, David. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I think I do think you know. Uh, Bridging the gap a little bit between the science fiction community and the SETI community would be a bigger thing. So, for instance, 